And well, the Lord is good. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Praise God. Good to have you here as we get into the summer months. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Got some teens in here tonight because your fearless leaders are at the beach. <laughs> Visited Daytona yesterday. Being at the beach reminds me, you know, Sunday morning I was talking about Peter walking on the water and I said, I know what it's like to be out in the middle of the water. Just, just, you know, just 300 yards from shore. And I said, I was a hundred miles offshore. I haven't been a hundred miles offshore. That was a slip of the tongue. I've been 20 miles offshore in the Gulf, not for what it's worth, not much, but I've been 20 miles offshore where the water was a hundred foot deep, 120 foot deep, but not, not a hundred miles offshore. Uh, praise God. I'm speaking of water, Junior, you know where you got that 10 pound bass the other night? Well, let's see what night was it? Sunday night, I caught one that was two and a half, a fish that was two and a half times that big within 10 yards where you caught that fish. Unfortunately, he had whiskers and wasn't a bass. <laughs> 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 oh, amen. Praise God. But it was a good, what was it, Doug? You said it was a blue cat? We, we catch them catfish all the time. Some people do it on purpose. <laughs> Not what we're after. Praise God. Hallelujah. But it was a good fight. <laughs> well, the Lord is good. Can you say amen? You ready for the Word of God? Ah, you're a good looking bunch, a lively bunch, I can tell. Glory to God. Amen. Let's turn to John 13. John 13. Or look at John 13. Because if you've got a phone, you don't turn to anything, do you? John 13. Verses 34 and 35, John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Interesting because under the old covenant, under the law, you know, they were, they were told to love one another, to love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as just as I have loved you. Now, they couldn't do that in the Old Covenant, could they? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then in John 15, 12, John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, as, just as I have have loved you. Amen. The Amplified Bible says, this is my commandment that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. So like I said, in the old covenant, they were told to love one another. Now, some people see this and recognize this and other people just simply say, well, love is love, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. But, but I understand this line of thinking. To me, in agreement with a lot of people, what makes this new is that Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. It almost goes beyond just treating people the right way. To love people, you know, Jesus laid down his life. I didn't read that, did I? But Jesus says, verse, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 13, verse 12 again, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no end than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And not just to make the ultimate sacrifice for others, but, but you know, you cannot treat anybody else wrong, but there's a difference between that, don't you think, and actually being self-sacrificing? You know, abandon your rights, abandon what's best for you so that you can do the best for somebody else. That's the way God loves us. That's the way Jesus loved us. And so regardless of whether that's what new means or whether it's just love is love, Old Testament, we are to exhibit a selfless love, a lay down your life for others love, a self-sacrificing love for one another, we are to abandon and give up our rights and abandon. We may have to suffer something a little bit in order to seek somebody else's best or to help somebody else or do what, what's best for them. 
And that's the kind of love we've been called to as New Testament Christians. And as born again Christians with God's nature and love on the inside of us. How many know when you got born again the nature, your old spiritual nature left and God's nature moved in? God's love moved in. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. And so we can, we can, we can love others as or just as Jesus loved us. Hallelujah. And not just because we are trying to control our behavior or external action. You know, they had all those commandments. You had the big ten, but there were hundreds of commandments. <laughs> and you see, but those commandments were to control their outward behavior. But you know, Jesus came along and said, just because your outward behavior is right, because you're keeping some moral code, because you don't want to go to jail, because you want to appear to be holy, but even though your outward behavior is right, if in your heart you've got anger or lust or bitterness, whatever, then you're really not holy. Right? Amen? See, under the, under the, so, so the love of God in our hearts, if we allow it, glory to God, will control our outward actions. Amen? Amen? See, true holiness comes from the inside out, not the outside in. I cannot, you know, be angry with you outwardly or say bad things about you, but really have bitter feelings on the inside. That wouldn't be holiness, would it? But if I love you on the inside, amen, and I walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, and then, then, I, then that out of that right heart comes right actions, then that's true holiness. Are you following that? Amen. amen. So again, somebody may control their outward actions but have sin in their heart. But when our at outward actions are right because they come out of a right heart, then we are truly walking in love, we are truly walking in the Spirit, and we are walking in true holiness. Praise God. Now on Wednesday nights, we're looking at six keys to practicing love in everyday life. Six things, six, six things that are easy to understand that you can put into practice to grow in love and mature in love. Praise God. And, and this is part five, but we only looked at two of these keys because we're talking about a lot of other things like we just mentioned. Number one is practice treating each other the same way you want to be treated. Practice treating others the same way you want to be treated, which of course is the golden rule. Number two, refuse to hold anything against anybody. Can you say amen? amen. Practice that in everyday life. And then we're going to go on to number three. So let's turn to Matthew 12, or look at Matthew 7, rather. Matthew 7, 1 and 2. That's where I got 12. Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So number three of our six keys is, this, keys is this, don't have a judgmental, critical, condemning attitude toward others. Do not have a judgmental, critical, uh, condemning attitude toward others. Judge not, we're going to see that all, that's all wrapped up in this statement, judge not that you be not judged. Are you with me? First of all, let's talk about what this is not saying, what this is not saying. You often hear people say, you know, say, judge not. <laughs> you know, I know you caught me in the woods wanting to have sex with a tree, but judge not. <laughs> there is a thing in our warped society today where people have sex with trees. I'm not just making that up. But judge not. And you particularly hear it. I'm not, make, I'm not making it up. Look it up. And, and so it doesn't matter how twisted or warped it is. People say, judge not. Judge not. You're going to have to get over that so I can move on, all right? <laughs> Don't look it up, Margaret says. So judge not is not saying, you know, don't judge me as an attempt to justify or excuse or rationalize beliefs and behavior that are clearly wrong and sinful according to the Bible. Oh, yeah, this wasn't some warped, crazy person talking about nature. This was a college professor at a major university espousing that philosophy. So, so, don't judge me, though. Don't judge me. You're judging me. Don't judge me. Huh. 
So it's, so it's, 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 it's not an attempt to justify, excuse, or rationalize beliefs and behaviors that are, not, that are clearly wrong and sinful according to the Bible. Judge not is not a weapon to be used against anyone who cries out against sin or false teachings. You're judging me. The Bible says don't lie. I'm not judging you if I tell you the Bible tells, tells you don't lie. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. Judge not, judge not is not a trump card to prove people are intolerant. They just, bam, I'm going to throw the trump card. You know, like people are going to play the whatever card. The, the, the trump card to prove that you're intolerant because you won't accept every kind of ungodly, worldly, twisted, antichrist philosophy or unholy behavior as being okay. You're judging me. That's not what the scripture is talking about. Amen. I like what one guy said. I, I, I found this after I myself used that expression, the trump card. But he said this in kind of a humorous way. He said, when someone wants to justify their life choices, they pull out their trump card. Judge not, lest you be judged. Then they drop the mic. Expecting you to immediately embrace the fact that they want to get divorced, have an affair, be a man, be a woman, be a goat, marry a goat, sell goats, or whatever. <laughs> If you spend any time at all studying the, this Bible verse, you know that when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, he wasn't saying that we can't evaluate whether someone's choices are wrong or not. And then the Bible very clearly, you can, you can talk about this all night long, but, but you know this, the Bible tells us very clearly to have critical thinking and to be discerning and to not just automatically accept any and everything as being right and holy and good. John 7, 24 says, judge according to righteous judgments. Amen. I mean, to exercise church discipline, you'd have to make some judgments, wouldn't you? Glory to God. We are to discern between good and evil. We are to examine uh, doctrines to see whether they're good doctrines or bad doctrines. Good doctrines or false doctrines. We're, we're to examine the gifts of the Spirit to see if they're just done in the flesh or by the Spirit. We're, we're, they, they we're to examine whether somebody's a true prophet or a false prophet or a true teacher or a false teacher, you know? You have to make judgments to do that. We're to distinguish between what's real and false. We're to rebuke sin. All of that requires that we make judgments. Amen. No, judge not that you be not judged means don't have a critical, fault-finding, condemning, judgmental attitude or spirit. The Amplified Bible says, this is, this is Matthew 7, 1, do not judge and criticize and condemn. Do not judge criticize and condemn. Then it puts in parentheses, don't, don't judge, criticize, and condemn others unfairly with an attitude of self-righteous superiority as though assuming the office of a judge so that you will not be judged unfairly. And then the Amplified Bible, uncharacteristically, because it doesn't make many of these, gives a footnote and says in Matthew 7, 1, this is not a prohibition of judgment, nor is it a command to stop using godly wisdom, common sense, and moral courage together with God's written word to discern right from wrong, to distinguish between morality and immorality, and to judge doctrinal truth. There are many judgments that are not only legitimate, but are commanded. Then he gives several scriptures. John 7, 24, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 12, Galatians 1, 8, 9, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, 2 John 10. Amen. And so, amplify, do not judge and criticize others. Don't set yourself up as a judge. You see, we can say, you know, that's wrong behavior. But then if we say, you don't deserve the blessings of God. You don't deserve to go to heaven. You don't deserve mercy because you're acting that way. Then we set ourselves up as a judge. That's different. You see, the Williams translation says, stop criticizing others. Criticize is a pretty good word. It doesn't really capture everything that's being said here, but it captures at least a part of it. To criticize is to, is to find fault with others, to be, to be harsh, you know, to express disapproval, to badmouth somebody. You understand that? So when you combine what's being said here, and we'll look at it again, don't judge, don't be judgmental, don't be critical, don't be condemning. I believe this means don't harshly judge someone as being wrong in an attacking way and thus deem them worthy of some sort of penalty or punishment and not worthy of mercy and forgiveness and the blessings of God. That's what he's talking about when he says don't judge. He means don't harshly judge somebody as being wrong in an attacking way 
and deem them worthy of some sort of penalty or punishment and unworthy of forgiveness and unworthy of the blessings of God. Amen. I said amen. And so breaking this down, first of all, let's just talk about this because there's some good things here. Why do people criticize of others? Why are people critical of others? You ever thought about that? I'm talking about destructive criticism. You know, constructive criticism is designed to help us, not hurt us. So, you know, if somebody tells you that you're doing something wrong or you're doing something the wrong way, that, that's criticism. But if they're pointing and telling you, look, look let, me get, let me help you. If you'll do it this way, you'll get better results. That, that's, not construct, that's constructive criticism. That's trying to help you and bless you, not hurt you. But destructive criticism is just not designed to put you down and, and you know, uh, hurt you in some way, tear you down some way. And even when it comes to, to destructive criticism, you know, if we're really mature and we're really wise, you know, when you get one of those letters, like I get every once in a while, thankfully not too many, but once every three years or five years, it just rips me to pieces. First thing to do is go, is there any truth to any of this? Even though they're motivated by the devil, even though they're in the flesh, even though most of what they're saying is, is false, is there any truth to this that I can learn from? Now, that's not what I want to do, but I mean, that's the wise thing to do, the smart thing to do. Amen. And certainly if, if I'm out fishing and, and Harold says, you know, if you'll do this, I, I don't, I'm doing it my own way. No, if he's trying to teach me something that'll help me, then, then thank you. That blesses me. That doesn't hurt me. But why do people criticize other people in a destructive manner? Number one, ignorance. People make judgments because they don't know all the facts. Amen. And then they criticize and condemn somebody. We, we, are, we are critical maybe and even angry at the truck driver ahead of us. I mean, the speed limit is 60 miles an hour. He's driving 39. We've been behind him for 15 minutes. We can't get around him. And he's, he's driving slow. And maybe you say things about him and you say things about his driving ability and so forth and so on. And then all of a sudden he goes around a big curve and you see there's this little bitty car in front of him that you couldn't see. And he's the one driving slow, not the truck driver. And so we're criticizing somebody for, and, and blaming him and angry at him. And he's not even the one. He didn't even do anything wrong. Amen. I said, amen. Just because we don't know all the facts. Of course, there are much worse things in life that can happen than just being held up a few minutes. But totally, totally innocent people sometimes are criticized, maligned, betrayed, lied about, mistreated, and cursed just because the person talking about them doesn't have all the facts. So one reason, and there may be others, these are just three that the Lord showed me several years ago. One reason people criticize others is because they don't have all the facts or because of misinformation. Put it to you in modern day terms, because of fake news. <laughs> Amen. A second reason people criticize others unjustly at times is pride. Pride, pride says, my way is right, period, and I want my way, and I'm not going to listen to you, and I'm not going to yield to you, and I'm not going to submit to you. We're going to do it my way. Amen? And it's not willing to listen to others. It's not willing to listen to others' ideas. It's not willing to listen to their thoughts. It's not willing to listen to their opinions, even if it tears the company apart, even if it tears the family apart, even if it tears the church apart. I'm, we're going to do it my way. And of course, that, that, like I said, that leads to all kind of strife and disunity and division. Because you see, the problem is pride is not willing to yield or submit to others. And it wants to talk about people that doesn't want to do things its way. It's very interesting when you think about that. Because in James chapter 3, you know, verses 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Paul is saying that, that, that things that cause strife... And one of the reasons he says is because people are not operating in the wisdom of God. So in verse 17, he contrasts the wisdom of God that would not lead to strife with those who are operating in strife. And he says this, he says, the wisdom from God, particularly as it relates to causing division and strife and disunity, he says the wisdom from, that comes from God is peaceable, gentle, and then the King James says easy to be entreated. And, you know, it's like, well, what the heck does that mean? Easy to be entreated. Well, other translation says, willing to yield. Another translation says, reasonable. Another translation said is, the wisdom that comes from God is sweetly reasonable. Hallelujah. 
And see, if you're not sweetly reasonable, if you're not willing to yield, then that's going to cause a problem. And one of the main reasons people are not willing to yield is because in pride they think everybody else should yield to them. And, and whatever color I think this carpet ought to be, that's what it ought to be. I don't care what you say. You know, and well, churches have split over much less. How many of you know that's true? Amen. And a third reason, a third reason why people sometimes criticize others is insecurity and jealousy and envy. Insecure, jealousy, envy. Sometimes people have the wrong idea that if they put somebody else's, else down, it makes them look better. And I'm sure you've all heard it. If you haven't heard it, young people, this is an old saying. They think they can make their light shine brighter by putting everybody else's light out. You don't make your light shine brighter by putting somebody else's light out. I don't want them to get the attention. I don't want them to get the promotion. I don't want them to get the recognition. I don't want them to be used by God. I, I'm going to put them down so my light will shine. That didn't make your light shine brighter. The way, to make the, the way to make the darkness be brighter is go around lighting everybody that you can. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Amen. See, and, but what happens is if somebody is, is jealous or envious and, 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 and self-seeking and selfish, and, and carnally ambitious. It's all right to be ambitious, but you're not, you shouldn't be carnally ambitious. In other words, if you're carnally ambitious, then anybody that's in your way, they're, they're a rival. They're, they're, they're somebody that's got, you got to push out of the way to get to the top. No, bless God, help everybody that you can. But, but see, people that are envy and, envious and jealous, they don't like, or maybe a better way to say it is, they're jealous of seeing someone else get noticed, someone else get praised, or someone else get promoted, or somebody else get used by God. And again, this leads to strife. Go back to James 3, 14 through 16, and it says, where there is jealousy, King James says, where there is envy, where there is jealousy, and then it says strife, there is confusion in every demonic work. Other translations say it this way, where there is jealousy and selfish ambition. Jeal King James, where there is envy and strife, where there is jealousy and selfish ambition. And so the word translated strife or selfish ambition is an, e is a, is an interesting word because there's no single English word that really uh, portrays what that word means in the Greek. And so that word translated strife or selfish ambition means to desire to be above others and better than others. You know, in other words, I'm going to be number one. You're going to yield to me. You're going to listen to me. I'm the one that's going to get the praise. I'm the one that's going to get the recognition. I'm the one that's going to be seen. I'm going to, uh, if, you, if you're in my way, I consider you a rival, and I'm going to compete with you carnally, selfishly, so that I'm above you and you're beneath me. That's, that's the idea. So it means to be above others that leads to strife and ungodly competitiveness. So, so thus a, je it's a jealousy this motivated by carnal ambition. And this person is, how does this relate to being critical? They're critical of those they consider their rivals. And so a lot of translations will say it that way. Where there's, where there's jealousy and rivalry. Partisanship. Fighting with somebody. And then you're going to criticize them because, because you see them as, as being in your way. And I'm telling you, this, this is a big, 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 big deal on many levels. Because this is not walking in love. Because this opens the door to the devil in our lives. Because this causes strife and disunity. Amen. And then it's a big deal. You know, Jesus said, if you are judgmental, critical, and condemning, then you'll receive the same kind of treatment in return. Judge not, all that means, lest you be judged. So this ties back into what the Bible means when it says, judge not, meaning don't be judgmental, don't be condemning, don't be critical. Matthew 7 1 again from the contemporary English version says, Don't condemn others and God won't condemn you. The Phillips translation says, Don't criticize others. The Message Bible says, Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. The Passion translation says, Refuse to be a critic. Now, let, let's look at this. Let's look at this because uh, Luke also records this. Let's look at this in Luke chapter 6 because I want you to see something here. Luke chapter 6. I actually like it uh, better over here in Luke chapter 6. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to start in verse 27, guys. We're going to read, read Luke 27 all the way through Luke, Luke verse 38 because I want you to see this, judge not that you be not judged. And he says it a little bit differently over here. I want you to see this in context. Everything he's talking about here is love and forgiveness and showing mercy versus being condemning and critical and judgmental. So watch this, Luke 6, 27. But I say to you who hear, how many of you hear? Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, if you only love, in other words, those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners can do that. Verse 34, and if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Verse 36, therefore... Be merciful just as your father also is merciful. In context now of all that we've read, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. See, don't be judgmental. Don't be condemning. Give and in perfect context, he's not talking about money. It applies to money because the law of sowing and reaping applies to every area of our life. But in perfect context, when he says give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will, will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. If you give love, if you give mercy, if you give kindness, then that's what's going to be measured back to you. But if you're judgmental and condemning, then that's going to be measured back to you. Now, like I said, don't misunderstand. That certainly applies to finances because it's the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping is just applied to this particular area here, but it also can be applied to finances because it's true. What you sow, you reap. That's all this is saying. And the way that you sow is the way that you're going to reap. Amen. Glory to God. So, Luke, so, so, so walk in love. In context, walk in love. Practice the golden rule. Bless and curse not. Be kind, be merciful, be forgiving, and don't be judgmental, and don't be condemning. You see that? The Passion Translation says, For, Forsake the habit of criticizing and judging others, and you will not be criticized and judged in return. Don't condemn others, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive over and over, and you will be forgiven over and over and over. So don't condemn in the sense that you decide they need to be punished and they don't deserve forgiveness and they don't deserve blessings. That's what it means to condemn somebody. You get that? So again, I believe this is, this is, this is you know, people have different interpretations, but I believe this is the truth. When you look at all this in context in the Greek and in line with all scriptures, this is saying don't be overly critical and don't harshly judge someone as being wrong in an attacking way, and therefore deem them worthy of some sort of penalty, of some sort of punishment, and not worthy of forgiveness, and not worthy of mercy. Hmm. Lest you be judged and receive in accordance with the same way you dish it out, the same sort of treatment in return. And so, you know, one of the primary ways we do this is with our tongue, with our words, so we should closely guard and watch what we say about others. Can you say amen? amen? Certainly we can judge that something is wrong and not in line with the Bible, but we are not to have a critical, judgmental, fault-finding, condemning attitude towards others. Amen? Amen. So in Luke's gospel, now watch this. I want you to see this. It, we just read it, Luke 6, 36. Be merciful just as. Everybody say just as. Be merciful just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. If you're attacking somebody in a critical way, are you being merciful? If you're condemning them and, and saying, uh, you know, God will never bless them, God will never use them, is that being merciful? If you're being judgmental, is that being merciful? So you see the context here. Therefore, be merciful just as, just as. 
We know that God's mercies to us are new every morning. We like to sing about that, aren't they? Are, are God's mercies new to you every morning? Well, that person that did something stupid or maybe did something against you, are, are they new to that person every morning? Or does that only apply to you? How about those left-wing radical kooks? Does it apply to them? Can they receive God's mercy? Or does the blood of Jesus only cleanse us? <laughs> Are they wrong? Yes. But do they deserve mercy? Can they receive mercy? We know God's mercies are new to us every morning. We, and that scripture says, you know, they never come to an end. Matthew 5, 7. Now think about this. Judge not that you be not judged. M Matthew 5, 7. Jesus, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. But what if you don't show mercy? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What if you're not merciful? Hmm? Being judgmental, critical, and condemning is... I want you to see the tie here. Being judgmental and critical and condemning is not showing mercy, nor is it being forgiving. If we truly forgive them, when they, why would we, we, we harshly criticize and attack them and, 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 in essence, condemn them to not being worthy of the blessings of God? James 2.13, judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Wait a minute. In other words, if you don't show any mercy, you won't receive any mercy. Now he's talking to Christians. He's not talking to the world. We're not talking about our, 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 our legal standing with it. This is God talking to his children. He said, if you're not going to show any mercy, then you're not going to receive mercy. But, and the, this judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy, James 2.13, but, amplified, to the one who has shown mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. How does mercy triumph over judgment? Our sin, even as a believer, if we make a mistake, our sins may cry out against us and demand justice. They ought to pay for what they did. They don't deserve the blessing. They don't deserve to get their prayers answered. They don't deserve the, the blessings of God on their life. But Jesus, because of his shed blood, advocates for us to have mercy. You know, a lawyer, you may not know this, most of you do, but a lawyer is sometimes called an advocate. And Jesus, because of his blood, advocates for our mercy. And his blood has never lost a case. He's never lost a case. So mercy wins out or triumphs over judgment because of what Jesus did for us at Calvary on the cross when he shed his blood and paid the price for every mistake we have ever made or every mistake we will ever make. That's how mercy triumphs over judgment. But we cut ourselves off from that mercy if we don't show mercy and forgive others. Judge not that you be not judged. Jesus said... Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. And there's lots of other scriptures. Ooh. And since we've been sown such great mercy, shouldn't we show mercy to others? Huh. You, you remember, well, let's don't do that. Let, let's turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. A story you're well familiar with, but... but this is, this is eye-popping when you think about it in these terms. Matthew 18. I don't want to assume for granted people automatically. Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter came to him, that's Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter, leader of the pack. Hey, Jesus, I'm going to forgive somebody seven times. He's expecting Jesus to say, Woo, Peter, boy, you spiritual. Boy, you holy. Jesus said, I do not say unto you seven times, but 70 times seven. And then you read it in the other gospel, you know, and that implies all in one day. 70 times seven, 490 times. You'd have to be forgiving somebody about every minute and a half, you know, or something. 
He said, Therefore the kingdom of God is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him that owed 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents is an enormous sum of money. Now we don't know if that's 10,000 talents of gold or 10,000 talents of silver. But if it's, but if it's 10,000 talents of gold, it, it's just, bottom line, it was an insurmountable sum for this servant. This servant could never repay the debt that he owed. Just like you and I as Christians can never pay for our sin. We could try for a million years. We could try for a million times a million years. We could do work, good works for the next billion times a billion times a billion times a billion times. And we, we couldn't even come close to paying for our sins. Only Jesus and his shed blood could do that. So this servant had a debt he could not pay. That's the point. Verse 25, he says, he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children until payment be made. The servant fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant, same servant, went out and found his fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii. That's about a day's wages. So depending on which translation you read, you can see where this man owed a hundred million, four hundred million, whatever. And he goes out and finds somebody that owes him fifteen dollars. Now he's just been forgiven a hundred million dollar debt, let's say. And he goes out and sees this guy on the street that owes him fifteen dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe me. First time I read this scripture, you know, I thought, you know, trying to read it with understanding. I said, Jesus, you're going to have to explain this to me because I just don't see how somebody that had been, been released of such a big debt could possibly go out and, and grab somebody by the throat. And it goes on to say, throw him into prison because he didn't have the money to pay you. Why, I just don't understand why somebody, nobody would be that cruel and harsh. But Jesus said, that's exactly what my people do when they from their heart don't forgive people. You've been forgiven the big debt, the debt you could never repay, and then somebody does something. I don't care what they did to you compared to, compared to your sin. You know, it's just a little $15 nothing debt. And, and you know the story. So, so he threw him in the prison. His fellow servants came and told on him. Verse 34 says, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. And he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father will do to you if you from your heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So again, we see that this person would not forgive. And so he was given to the torturers. Judge not that you be not judged. If you don't show mercy, then you won't receive mercy. And the tortures, you know, that torture can be some kind of sickness, some kind of disease, some kind of mental problem, some kind of financial problem. The torture, you know, because you're not receiving any mercy. But here's what I want you to see, because we, we understand this. We understand. Listen, listen. This man went out and found someone who owed him just a few dollars, and he would not show him any mercy. Remember, mercy's being kind to people and merciful and forgiving is kind of the opposite of being judgmental and critical and condemning. If you're condemning, you're not showing mercy. And so this man went out and, and he did not show him any mercy, did not forgive him the debt. And, and we say, we say, we know, we know, we know, we know, we are to forgive. We've heard that a million times. But when we criticize and find fault in others, and deem them unworthy to receive God's blessings and deserving of some sort of punishment, are we not acting exactly like this man? Are we not, in essence, grabbing them by the throat? Ah, they're doing all this. They're stupid. And they ought to be, you know, and I don't think they're, God will never use them. God will never bless them. And what they did was stupid and idiotic. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I forgive them. <laughs> you do, huh? Are we not acting exactly like this man? Since we have been forgiven and shown mercy for an insurmountable debt and sin, should we not show mercy to others and not criticize them and condemn them and be judgmental? You follow that? You follow that? Amen. Glory to God. And, and see, and, and of course, through all these different scriptures, I mean, that, that opens the door to the devil to torment us. Because we have cut ourselves off from the mercy of God. Judge not that you be not judged. If you show mercy, you'll receive mercy. You know, James said, you know, uh, 
Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. James says, Judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. In other words, you won't receive mercy if you don't show mercy. And then in Corinthians, you know, Paul told them, because they weren't walking in love to others, which, which, you know, includes a lot of things. But he says, if you would judge yourself, you would not be judged. We're to judge ourselves. Amen. Yes, if something's wrong, it's wrong. But we leave them in the hands of God. And we're, we're never going to act like, you know, somebody becomes our enemy. A man called me today about, well, I shouldn't say that. But I mean, he, he's prophesying anybody that disagrees with him is going to die. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes people aren't prophesying it, but in their heart, they're wanting that to happen. Well, that's not showing any mercy, is it? Or just, just talking evil about people and being critical of others and hoping something bad happens to them. That's not showing any mercy. That's going out and grabbing somebody by the throat. Just like this man did in Matthew 18. Because we tend to think, oh man, I would never be like him. But if we don't forgive, we're being exactly like him. And if we don't show mercy, or an, if we are critical and judgmental and condemning, we're being exactly like him. Amen. So let's walk in love. 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 Let's walk in love. <laughs> Prince's bride. Love. <laughs> let's walk in love. Let's forgive. Let's show mercy and kindness to others. Praise God. Don't you think the world would be a better place? Amen. amen. I said amen. Let's stand up together. Praise God. I hope you see this. It, it, it just really opens up, not a can of worms, but it opens up a can of good worms in a way that you, it just tie, it starts tying in all kinds of scriptures together. You know, James goes on to talk about, you know, when, when you're doing this, you're setting yourself as a judge and there's only one judge and that's God. Amen. Now, you know, like I said, you got to go back to the balance of this. It's judge not is not a, is not a, not a, Card to excuse every kind of goofy behavior, sinful behavior, ungodly philosophy you can think about. And the Bible tells us to judge certain things. Amen. Glory to God. As a parent, you're, you're, you're judging your kid's behavior all the time. That's part of the problem is, is with, you know, in our society today is people didn't have anybody to lovingly parent them and advise them and correct them and help them and that's why they go out and do crazy things. Glory to God. Can you say amen? amen? Would you close your eyes, bow your heads, just in reverence to God and honor God? Anybody that you can think of that you've just been tearing apart with your words, being critical of, judgmental about, Like I've said many times in the last several years, we don't make the connection sometimes between, you know, there's a difference in going through a trial of your faith versus experiencing a problem because we've opened the door to the devil. Two totally different things. And sometimes people don't see that, that you know, sometimes the way you spell healing is R-E-P-E-N-T. <laughs> you know, not always, but sometimes. Help us, Father. We need to grow up in these areas. We need to walk in love and only use our words to bless and heal and encourage, not to tear down, not to destroy, not to hurt. Glory to God, not to be critical of others in a negative way, a harmful way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. We understand, Father, that certain people are going to get in trouble if they go the wrong way, but that, that's up to you. We know this. They deserve mercy because of what Jesus did for them. And if they will turn to you and accept you and look to you, then you will show them mercy, just like you showed us mercy. So we're aware of that. We recognize that. And we're not going to ever set ourselves up as a judge. 
to say they, in essence, what we're, whether we realize or not, to in essence say they don't deserve blessing, they don't deserve favor, they don't deserve mercy, they don't deserve forgiveness. No, because of Jesus, they all deserve And I realize everybody's not going to get it because it's up to them to receive it, but they deserve it because of the blood of Jesus, because he died on the cross to save us from all of us from our sins. And so we're just, we're just, just, just barely is eight o'clock right this second. Just, just allow the Lord to deal with you. If there's nothing needs to be dealt with. Just say, praise God. Sometimes if we're, if we're, sometimes we're shooting for the, for the high calling and sometimes we may be missing it, but, but we're going to keep shooting. We're not going to give up on ourselves. We're going to forgive ourselves. Can you say amen? I have to forgive myself all the time. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. 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 Well, we're glad that you came tonight. Praise God. I wish I could express some of these things in a, you know, we'll keep working at it. How about that? You keep praying for us and we'll keep working at it. Glory to God. We love you so much. We're glad if you were with us online. Amen. Glory to God. If you're at the beach, I hope it rains all day tomorrow. No, I'm just teasing. I'm, I'm teasing. I hope you have perfect, perfect, perfect weather. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>